Welcome to the Emancipate Your Mind podcast. I'm your host, certified religious transition and trauma recovery coach, Terry Hales. I help people step out of the shadows of religious fear and shame and embrace their authentic selves with love and empathy. If you're ready to throw off the shackles of learned binary thinking and explore a more nuanced approach to life, this is your playground. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Emancipate Your Mind podcast. I am so excited. I have my good friend, Christopher Peck, who is a communication coach with Speak Into Action and just also one of my very favorite people to talk about deconstruction with and just all of the mysteries about building relationships and how we show up in the world as our authentic selves. And I'm really thrilled for today's conversation. We're going to be talking about intentionality and building community. So, Chris, welcome to the podcast. Hey, it's good to be back, Terry. Thank you again for having me on. I can't wait. We've already had a little bit of discussion before we started recording. And I think today's conversation is going to be really rich. And I can't wait to see what comes up because when you and I start talking, we go into all different kinds of rabbit holes. So, Ah. Yeah, we have no idea we're going to end up on the on the other side of this. Yeah, no, I have a feeling this is going to be a very long conversation that we have to split up into two episodes. But I have a feeling I'm going to walk away with a lot of new insights, and I hope the listeners do too. Yeah, and and I am positive that I will as well. So <laughs> yeah, let's do it. I always do. I never talk to you and not walk away with insights, which is why I'm having you on the podcast because I'm like, if I get this much out of the conversation. And I know that you're often like, oh, I have insights whenever we're talking. I think our listeners are just going to come along for the ride. And I think it's going to be fantastic. All right. We're diving into building community. And one of the first things that came up for you, Chris, was the idea of being intentional in our relationships. And so tell me what brought that up for you. And we'll just kind of go from there. Yeah, no, thanks for asking. So um, for listeners who don't know, and I would imagine that almost all of them, I grew up in the Church of Christ, which is a very conservative, um, high demand form of Protestantism, although the Church of Christ would not affiliate themselves with the Protestant movement, because the whole concept behind the Church of Christ, um, it was founded in the late 1800s, uh, Bart Stone and Alexander Campbell. And their whole thing was we, the, the church, Protestantism, right, has gotten so far away from the first century church. And so we're going to take it all the way back to the New Testament. If it doesn't happen in the New Testament, then it doesn't happen, right? So that's why the Church of Christ doesn't use musical instruments, because there's nothing in the New Testament that suggests otherwise. Um, just, just a very legalistic organization. I was born into it. It was my birth faith. So I... As I was preparing for this conversation, I was kind of thinking about that that kind of like wonky back and forth between being intentional and being reactive in our relationships, right? Um, and as a communication coach, I'm always teaching individuals to show up intentionally. But Christianity and, and the Church of Christ was my birth faith. And so I was kind of reactively thrust into a community of individuals. And I was thinking about just like how challenging that interplay is is we're given a predetermined group of individuals that we have to engage and have relationships with, which is a reactive place to be. But then we, based on the rules that are presented, based on like the, the community decorum that's meant to be maintained, we show up intentionally in the way that we want those individuals to see, feel, and experience us. And so for me, when I left Christianity, when I went through my own deconversion, I went through my own deconstruction, there was kind of this question mark around like, when was I being intentional with my relationships? Was I ever intentional with my relationships? Was I just reactive? No, I wasn't completely reactive. And so I think probably a lot of our listeners right now who are exploring new communities and trying to find new relationships are also kind of hanging on to some old scripts from mm-hmm. the community that they left. And it's probably making it challenging for them 
to show up and have entirely intentional relationships because there are still these reactive scripts that they're, that they're comfortable with, right? Most of us are comfortable engaging in the language of our birth space, right? It may not be what we want to do, but it's just like a really comfortable, easy place. We know, like, we know all the right things to say, you know, we like, and, and there's something comfortable about having those systems in place. And now we have to build all of that from scratch as we go out and create new relationships. And so that really challenging interplay between intentionality and reactivity um, is maybe, maybe not is like right there on our mind, but as we're talking about it, it's like, oh yeah, I wonder, I wonder if I was ever intentional in my relationships. No, I probably was, but was I intentional enough? How can I be more intentional? Mm -hmm. Right. So I think there's just a lot of question marks. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think one of the things I want to clarify before we go any further, because I know there are some people probably listening that are like, when we say intentional, what do we mean? And when we say reactive, what do we mean? So can we clarify those two terms a little bit? No, thank you for, yeah, thank you for, for doing that. Um, so when I talk about intentionally showing up in our relationships, it's having a plan, knowing how, and what I say is like knowing how we want to be seen, felt, and experienced by others, Right. As a communication coach, I'm not afraid to tell my clients that you're always presenting yourself, right? And so the work I do, and a little bit more about me, I have a background in theater, right? So I'm a stage director by trade, and I've taken that stage direction work, and now I apply it to my business and my personal clients. And, and so from that perspective, I'm not afraid to say that people are showing up and performing for one another. Right? I just want to let that land. Like we're showing up, we're performing for one another, we're presenting for one another. Um, and when I, so when I talk about being intentional, it's about walking into a space and knowing how we want to be seen, felt, and experienced by others. Right? If we were to cast ourselves as the lead in our play, like what do I want my audience to experience from me? Mm -hmm. And just having a plan and, and having even scripts in place so that we know how to go into a space and intentionally be seen, felt, and experienced by others, as opposed to walking into an environment and building relationships off of what we assume are the expectations for us that are being, we're, we're basically perceiving the perceivers, if that makes sense, right? I walk into an environment and I perceive that these individuals want these things from me. And so I'm going to present those right? And so everything we're doing is, I think this person wants to see this, this, and this, so that's what I'm going to give to them, right? And that was very much my experience in the Church of Christ, is I knew that I got brownie points for doing this, and I knew that other people would perceive me as being good enough if I did this, mm -hmm. right? And so it's reacting to those rules and trying to present ourselves in such a way that people see those elements of ourselves, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I do have a question. So it sounds like, I mean, the last time you and I talked, we were talking about authenticity and I, I feel like this kind of like weaves into this a little bit too, just the idea that we're presenting both of them are presenting something. So on the one hand, we're either choosing what we want to present, what we want to share, how we want to show up, um, who we want to be in a space. And it sounds like in reactivity, what we're doing is we're going in first and kind of reading the room and figuring out what people want from us and then giving them those pieces of ourselves, whether they feel genuine or not. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, I would say the biggest difference. So imagine it. So imagine like from a, from a, we'll say from like a business perspective. Okay. okay. I would say a business that's showing up intentionally, I walk in and I immediately understand the experience they're trying to create. Okay. Right. The branding is on point. Like I know what kind of environment and space that I am in. I know what the expectations are. I know what they're trying to sell. I know the, the kind of community environment they're trying to share. Right. That's, that's a very intentional business identity. Versus walking into a space and you can just feel it. You're like, the clients chose how this organization is going to show up, right? Through, 
you know, the, like the business opened and then you can tell that some people came in and they had some things to say and some other people. And so it, it kind of lacks identity because mm-hmm. you can tell that it's catering to a lot of different identities. Yeah. Um, or, right. Or over time, like we could see a very robust, and that's the thing is reactivity is not always a bad thing. Like you could see a really robust identity that's created from a place of reactivity, right? It's just the big difference being when I am being intentional, I'm making the decision. When I'm being reactive, I'm allowing other people to make that decision for me. I love and how often you boil that down. A healthy balance. Yeah. And oftentimes there, you know, of course there's a need for a healthy balance in between. Right? Yeah. Like, you know, we want autonomy, but also there are community standards, right? In terms of belonging. Right. And so we don't want to be so abrasive and unyielding that like that we never meet people halfway. And we don't want other people making the decision for us how we get to show up in our lives, in our relationships, and in our community. Yeah. Yeah. It's that it's that give and take that we're all a part of as we're building relationships. This idea that, you know, there is my wants, my needs, like the, the things that make me, me. And then there's also the needs of the group and the needs of the people that I'm relating with and having relationships isn't two individuals that completely remain in their bubbles and they don't touch. We have to find a way to like integrate those bubbles in ways that feel comfortable for us. So I think in those places, like how do we decide how much we're giving and how much we're taking, how do we find where that right mix is? Ooh, I mean, that's, that's, that's a great question that I almost kind of want to bounce back on you. Um, because to me, it feels a little like we're digging into boundaries. Yeah. Right. And I know you've done a lot of work on boundaries. I, um, so I grew up with a really strong people pleaser mentality. Mm-hmm. Right. Me too. And, and so from that perspective, I have had to establish, I have a challenging time establishing boundaries Mm -hmm. sometimes Um, because oftentimes if I'm, if my, if I, if it appears that my boundaries are putting someone else out, right, then I still have some old scripts and some old tapes that tell me like I'm being selfish or I'm not giving enough of myself, right? And I know you've done a ton of work around boundaries. And so I'm going to, bounce this one back to you and ask when you are building a new relationship, where do you put that boundary first? Mm, That's a really good question. I think it really kind of depends on the person. Like, I think it's very individual. Um, I have a tendency to go in more open than closed, like to assume the best in other people and to assume that I'll be received. Well, that's just kind of who I am. I know other people, don't like that's that's not part of their like natural personality they have a tendency to go in more guarded um yeah but for me I have a tendency to like go in and assume that marbles will be put in the jar we talk about you know putting marbles in the jar so that we feel comfortable being vulnerable so I have a tendency to assume that people have good intentions that they're going to add marbles into the jar however um I do constantly check in with myself to see how am I feeling in this relationship? Mm. Does it feel like a healthy give and take? And if not, like if I have some, like um, some feelings of maybe not feeling completely comfortable or feeling, you know, not fully safe, then I get curious with that to figure out like, what is it that's going on? And you know, that really kind of points me into like the direction of maybe red flags or places where I need boundaries. So I don't always go in. I think the only boundary I have with new people is just, I get to check in with me and see if this is working with me or not, Mm. if that makes sense. And I'll set boundaries with people depending on where those boundaries need to be set as I continue to check in with myself with that person, if that makes sense. No, it does. And actually, I love what you said, because it, it really beautifully sums up actually the way I work with, because I've got a lot of personal clients who 
so much of the communication work that they're doing right now does revolve around building community and building relationships and how we're seen, felt, and experienced in our personal and professional lives. And, and what I like that you said, because um, you are starting out intentionally, right? Mm-hmm. You're saying, how do I want to be seen, felt, and experienced by others? And you're saying, well, I do want to give people the benefit of the doubt. And I, w- I do want to keep myself like relatively like vulnerable and open to individuals, um, assuming the best. Right. And so you're coming in with intentionality and then you're taking, you're just taking stock of your own awareness. How does this feel? I'm checking in with myself. So you're showing awareness and you're showing curiosity. And that's exact, to go back to your original question, that's exactly how I would suggest that individuals go about building new relationships and finding new community is to just decide on the front end, right? Where do you want those boundaries to be? You know, if you want to have a pretty flexible boundary, okay, and then get aware around the places where it does or does not feel right to you, Mm -hmm. right? And get really curious with that. What's going on right now? Like, who's this person who just, you know, walked into the room who like kind of set my alarm bells off? Why am I feeling that way? Is it because they're a man? Is it because they're a woman? Is it because they're in a position of authority is because they remind me of someone who had spiritual authority over me, but just getting really, really curious with ourselves, right? And then I think that's where healthy reactivity does come in, right? Is, okay, around this person, I want to put up just a few more guards until I get to know them better, right? Um, Yeah. And so being really intentional. And then the other side being, you know, If you want to show up intentionally and say, I'm going to be super guarded right now because I was just hurt by a community that like took away my trust. I don't know if I have a lot of space to put up with, you know, put up with anything from anyone. So I'm going to go into this environment and I'm going to make people earn my trust, Mm -hmm. right? If that's how you intentionally want to show up, then give it a try and then see what you're getting from it. You know, if you go out three or four or five different times, and you're not feeling like you're opening up or building, then you might need to play with that intentionality a little bit. Um, but I think making a decision on the front end, how do I want to be seen, felt, and experienced is the first place that we can start. Yeah. There's something that you brought up that I really love, which is that we try things on. I don't think any of us know where our boundaries are straight out of the gate. I think we learn our boundaries through our relationships. And so I love how you talked about being intentional. Either you can be intentionally open or you can be intentionally more guarded. And then we reassess. We continue to check back in with ourselves and see, you know, is this working? Does this feel, does this feel the way I was hoping it would feel? And if not, getting curious with those places of where it's not working or it's not bringing us the results that we hoped it would bring us. And problem solving. I think many of us are are worried that we have to choose who we're going to be and how we're going to be. And then we make that choice once. And then that's just who we are always. And that that doesn't bend or give or take. And and it's not, we're going to evolve, not just personally, but we're going to evolve in our relationships with every single person because they're evolving too. So People I was friends with whenever I was a child, for instance, our relationship's going to change as we move into teenagerhood and as we move into our 20s and as we start to get married and we start to have kids, we're evolving as people. We're having different life experiences. It's changing who we are. And that's going to change our relationship because the individuals, the individual ingredients of that of that recipe of that relationship, they're changing. So I think our boundaries continue to change and to grow too as we move into those different stages and evolve as people. Yeah. Although trying it on, like it requires a little bit of trust in ourselves. Mm -hmm. Like we have to, we have to believe that what we're trying on, well, we basically have to believe that we're capable of making our own decisions to try things on. And I know, you know, one of the things that we were talking about before we went live was, you know, this, the difference between birth faith and chosen faith. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, in my circumstances, I was born into the Church of Christ. And so I was born into that environment. I was born into those relationships. And so when I walked away from it, there was a certain level of, I love these people and they were never really my people. Mm-hmm. 
And, and I think there was a lot of acceptance in that. I'm wondering, you know, what about the other side of that? Like what happens when you chose a faith, right? And we know that individuals who choose a faith tend to be the most zealous, right? All in. And then that individual walks away or is ostracized or, and now you're in a position where you did choose a community and you feel like you chose wrong. How in those environments or how in those circumstances do you feel you trust yourself when you kind of feel like you can't trust yourself? Yeah. Well, and I think this happens even when we deconstruct because I, I feel like sometimes we leave high demand communities high demand faiths. And then sometimes we'll choose another high demand community that's in the deconstruction space, or we will um, follow another charismatic leader who seems to have all the answers or seems to have it figured out. And I think it does like we do take a hit to our, our sense of Um, self-trust. But I think we heal the trust. I think, I think we learn to trust ourselves just by giving ourselves the space to get curious, because really when we're in those high demand religions, we've kind of turned off our personal curiosity. We've turned off that attachment to our inner knowing. And so, yes, you turn that off in order to be a part of the group. I think just maintaining a connection to yourself, like, can I continue to check in with myself and see how am I feeling? Does this still feel good? Do I feel like I can ask questions or be different in this group? Do I feel like it's okay for me to change and evolve? Because you will. That's going to happen whether you're in a high demand group or not. And as I change and evolve, is that going to be welcome and accepted? Or is that going to be suppressed either by myself or by the group? And just getting curious with that. I don't think we become aware of group dynamics until they're presented to us because sometimes high demand groups feel really great at the beginning. There's all that love bombing and acceptance and like you feel like you found your people and it doesn't just happen in religion. I mean, for people who have, you know, known me for a while and heard my story for a while, not only was I part of a high demand religion, but then, you know, that kind of happened in the military when Kevin was in the military. It uh, kind of happened in a Boy Scout group. After we left the church, we joined a Boy Scout group, and there was some of that that happened. Um, I I was part of an MLM for a while, and and it felt that yeah. way too. Like, oh, this is what girl friendships are supposed to feel like, and this is great and supportive, until it wasn't great and supportive. And then I realized, oh, like I'm not allowed to do things differently, or feel differently, or you know, not follow the script. Um, it didn't, I mean, so, but it, that came from checking in with myself, like, oh, oh, it doesn't feel good anymore. And I think that's how we build that self-trust is just giving ourselves not only permission, but like making it a priority to check in and see, how do I feel here? Do I feel comfortable? Do I feel safe? And does it feel okay for me to be an individual here? Or am I kind of oh. un- do I have to be like everybody else here? Yeah, no, I love that you bring that up. You know, one of the things that I talk about with clients is the three different audiences that we have. Like you have your audience of one, right? And that's the relationship that we're in right now, where it's just you and I chatting together. We have our relationship of many, right? Or our audience of many, right? That's mm-hmm. our public speaking opportunities, although it's all public speaking. But I think the piece that we forget is our relationship with self or our audience of self. Mm-hmm. And when, you know, when we're talking about intentionally building relationships or intentionally building community, all of that intentionality needs to be directed towards us too. Like we need to decide how do we want to show up for ourselves? How do we want to be seen, felt, and experienced by ourselves, mm-hmm. right? And talk about a lot of awareness and curiosity there because it's not just us, it's all the pieces of us along the way, right? All of those, and I will call them authentic moments of us, right? I remember like when I was in high school, um, obviously being a theater guy, like I would like, I would write scripts for church and we'd do these, you know, we'd, and we'd do these small shows and I would lead singing. And, you know, I was, I was a really actively involved member of the church of Christ. 
Um, I got a lot of FaceTime. That was absolutely an authentic version of me. It's not how I would show up today, but it was the culmination of every experience I'd had up until that moment, right? With me authentically presenting myself in front of this church group. And so I think we have to recognize that all those moments along the way were authentic and then decide, yes, and how do I want to be seen, felt, and experienced now? Yeah. Like, what does it look like now? And checking in with ourselves and getting aware and getting curious. And when we do go out into our communities and we do go out into our relationships and we say, I want to be seen, felt, and experienced as this, this, and this. And then somebody comes into the room or a group of individuals come into the room or we're presented with old friends and we automatically shrink back, right, to those old scripts because that's what's most comfortable. That's a great moment for us to say, wow, I need to sit down and I need to to write some new scripts. Because I did not show up for myself the way that I wanted and in turn didn't show up and present the version of myself that I wanted. So this is obviously an area of growth. This is an area where I'm going to have to get comfortable being uncomfortable, Mm -hmm. right? And I think it's also telling us too that, hey, like maybe that's not the right person or the right community because it shouldn't be hard for us to show up as the version of ourselves we like the best. Yeah. I do think that, I mean, just one thing that's coming to mind. I do think that there is a place sometimes in our relationships with people who are used to us, like showing up in one way that there can be a grace period of, as you know, we continue to like say, Hey, I've evolved. I'm different now. There may be some changing of patterns that takes a little bit of time. And that can be a little bit uncomfortable even with people that you're highly compatible with. But I think overall in groups, especially like bigger groups, um, I I don't necessarily know that that happens on a bigger group level, but I think like, I I think there just are groups that you become incompatible with. But I think when it comes to relationships, there can be that time of like, let's change our normal pathways and the ways that we relate with each other and like our expectations You keep talking about um, reactive scripts, and I want to ask you some questions about that really quickly. Like, what are these reactive okay. scripts, and how do they show up, and how do we know that we're we're acting from these reactive scripts with people? Yeah, that's good. Thank you for asking. Okay, so my favorite example of a reactive script: you go to the grocery store, mm-hmm. you're in the checkout lane, the grocery store says, the grocery store clerk says, "Hey, how are you doing?" And you say, without even thinking about it, "Fine, how are you?" Right. This is like this is a reactive script that most of us engage in probably several times per day. Right. It's just it's just built in. It is a quick and easy way to create forgettable relationships with forgettable people. Right. And we do it all the time. That to me, that's a great example of a reactive script. What. I notice, and what I've noticed in my own deconstruction, but also my own work in interpersonal communication, is when we show up and something, I don't necessarily want to use the word triggers, right? Because I think that's an overused word, but something happens, right? Something, we observe something in our environment that maybe it's a conscious level, maybe it's a subconscious level, makes us feel unsafe. And so we go to, the place where we feel safest, which is these reactive scripts, right? These places that we've practiced over and over and over again and come so easy to us. Like I am great talking about baseball. I could talk to like I could talk to two about baseball with anyone. It's just a script that I feel really comfortable with. Um, and if I had to, I could absolutely hold conversation with a Church of Christer as long as they need, right? Because I know the language. But it's when we go into these intentional places where we're like, I want to build new relationships. I want to be seen, felt, and experienced as this, this, and this. And then something changes our environment and we fall back on those reactive scripts. Mm-hmm. And, and to, to, your, to your question, what do we do about that? That's when we get aware, right? And I, I encourage people to, um, to have like an awareness journal. Hey, I went out, I was trying to build a relationship. Um, or I went to this new networking group, or I joined this new community, and something felt off to me. And getting curious around that feeling, 
right? It's, I mean, it's a little ambiguous, but honestly, that's the best we can do is to get curious with ourselves, to get aware around those moments. And then if we really do want to make that change, what was the script we used, that reactive script? And what's an intentional script that we can put in its place? And if you have to write it down, right? Write it down in that awareness journal and take that awareness journal with you the next time you go out and you're building relationships so that when somebody asks you, right, or somebody's engaged with you in a certain conversation, you're able to come in with that intentional script and try it on and see how it feels. Um, but if we don't script it, we won't say it. If we don't practice it, we won't perform it. Yeah. Well, and I love that you talk about recognizing the script and then writing a new one. And I find that role play is really helpful as well. So finding a safe person that can role play this with you, it it starts that neural pathway, that that new way of yeah. being, that new way of showing up. Um, it gives your brain something to work with. It might not be as strong. Maybe the next time you're confronted with this situation, there may be that that big push to go into that reactive script, but you have that little yeah. like practice channel that you've already started that you can switch to because you've already, like you said, you've already scripted it out. You've already practiced it. And, and your brain is like, oh, I know what to do. It might not be as natural or comfortable because we haven't practiced this as much, but I have something to work with. Well, and, and the other piece that you're, that you're playing to is also that path of least resistance. I remember hearing the story and I can't remember if it was a dietitian or a nutritionist, but they were talking about, they had a client and the client was really struggling to lose weight. And it just so happened that the client, right, every day after work on their way home, there was this one fast food chain that they always stopped at. Right? And so the dietitian or the nutrition was like, why don't you change your direction home? Why don't you change the pathway that you're making so that you don't go by, so that that's not, so it's no longer a, a path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. And we'll always fall back on the easy thing to do if we don't replace it to your point with something new that over time we can take ownership of and will become the easy thing for us to do. Yeah. And so I do think replacing those reactive scripts with very intentional ones is that's how we change our path of least resistance is we just change our direction home. Yeah. And I find, I don't know if you find this is how it works for you too, but I find whenever I'm changing those scripts, really like the way it works is I will identify the script or I'll identify a part of it and then kind of mm -hmm. like write a piece of it and I will go and practice and it won't go very well the first time. Like it, mm -hmm. it, it's mm -hmm. iffy, it's shaky. Um, and I'll come back and I'll, I'll get curious with that again. Like what was happening? Why, why didn't that go well? And I'll kind of refine the script over time. And as I'm building that neural pathway, I'm refining the script and finding out what works for me and how I can show up in a way that feels comfortable and what works and what doesn't. Do you find that it's like that for you as well? Oh my gosh. I mean, you just explained the rehearsal process, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, so I've got six or eight weeks to work with a group of individuals, put them on stage, put the story on stage, and I'm handing them a script and saying, this is your world, right? And it's a script that, you know, maybe they've read once, you know, but it's like they have no ownership over it. Mm -hmm. So certainly in those first couple of weeks, right, as we're blocking and we're putting the story together on stage, right? Yeah, there's virtually no ownership. And then we get to this interesting place that I call like the teenage awkward phase of a play, right? Where everybody's supposed to be off book, but nobody's quite there yet. And the relationships aren't coalescing the way they need to because the script's in the way. Mm -hmm. And it's really, really uncomfortable for a really long time. And then everybody starts turning a corner. And it's like, and they've got that script and they own that script and they know how to use that script. So that by the time you get to opening night, right, you are ready to go. Now, the challenging part is we don't get six to eight weeks, mm -hmm. right? Because, the, because we don't have an environment, right, where we can just go and like stand on stage and practice in front of Chris, you know, until we've got it just the way we want it. We have to go out in all of those different phases of our own rehearsal process and practice in real you know, in real time with real people as we're managing real relationships. And, and, and that's one of the big challenges is continuing to do this really uncomfortable thing 
knowing that eventually we are going to turn that corner. You know, we don't have to throw out the script. Like we don't like, we don't have to abandon everything. Like you're going to get there. You have to give yourself the time. You have to give yourself the practice. Yeah. One of the things that was coming up for me as you were talking about the rehearsal process, having done some theater in my past as well, um, was how when you very first start off with a script, it doesn't feel like you. It feels mm. wrong. It feels clunky. It feels like you're pretending to be someone else, maybe a little bit. Um, oh. But then by the end, when you do turn that corner, like you, you and the character are one. You are, you are like that character has become you. You are the character. You embody that. And it it feels, it feels like a second skin. It just feels like, you know, who you're supposed to be in that moment, at least. And so um I think that that it's like that in real life as well like when we very first start trying on new patterns of behavior it feels clunky it feels uncomfortable it it doesn't feel like us it feels and we can get curious with that as well because maybe there's some things we tweak that you know are making it feel a little bit more uncomfortable than it needs to be but I think by the end it just feels like us we we are that kind of person that shows up in that kind of way in these relationships, the ways that we want to show up, the the intentional ways that we're hoping to show up. No, abs- I mean absolutely. Um, and and the thing that came to my mind was, I mean, imagine doing all of this, but we have been this other person, and kind of right. We've been ourselves, right? But now, you know, now we're in a position, and particularly with the audience we're talking to right now, now we're in a position of. Uh, we're ha- we have a faith transition, or we're deconverting, or we're deconstructing. And I know in my experience, deconverting was leaving the church, mm-hmm. right? Deconstruction was figuring out all the ways that the church has yet to leave me. Mm-hmm. And so, and so from that perspective, you know, we're leaving this environment where we maybe it was reactive at first, maybe it was intentional at first. Um, but there are definitely places in there where we were very intentionally showing up as a specific type of individual for our community, right? And if you do that long enough, right, it, yeah, it's going to become you. And so now you're walking away from that, right? And, and you're, you're confused, you're scared, you're angry. All you want to do is like burn down the church and build like this brand new relationship with all these awesome like agnostics and atheists and you don't want to have anything to do, but you're still, you're still living off of the internal expectations of perfectionism or defensiveness or people pleasing or, you know, I I don't know about you, but in my situation, like I'm an expert in my field. And yet I find myself from time to time, if somebody else is like, oh, I know a little bit about communication, deferring to them as authority. Mm. Like, because I spent so much time growing up having to defer to authority that even if I was 100% confident that what I knew was true, if somebody else said you're wrong, then I would just assume that that was the case because they're the authority. They're always the authority. And so I was always handing over spiritual power and spiritual authority to other individuals. That's an area that I have to work in Mm -hmm. um, as I show up, you know, and decide how I want to be seen, felt, and experienced. Yeah. I think authority is a big deal for a lot of us. I think it's one of the things, a man in a suit, I find myself so often going back to those old scripts, especially if it's an old man in a suit, an old white man in a suit, even worse. So yeah. 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 If I find myself in a position where I'm supposed to be the expert and there's an old white man in a suit that says you're wrong, it's really difficult for me to just be like, okay, like you can have your opinion and I'll have mine, but this is what I've studied for this many years. Right. Right. And so and so you're at odds with yourself, right? On the one hand, you're like, I know that what I am saying is true. And, right, there's all those different authentic pieces of you along the way that were, you know, that were made to, like, give that away. You Mm -hmm. know, you've talked about your experiences as, like, and, like, even as a strong female, which I feel you are, like, you had to give so much away in that high-demand patriarchal system, right? That, yeah, so those old scripts pop up for us all the time. 
It's about getting aware around them, right? Getting yeah. curious around them. And then how do I, okay, how do I tweak that script slightly so that the next time an old man with a suit walks in, I know what to say and I feel comfortable saying it or I feel uncomfortable saying it, but I'm going to say it anyway. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's where we start. I'm going to feel uncomfortable saying it, but I'm going to do it anyway. Or I, I'm going to feel uncomfortable doing it or being it, but I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah. 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 Well, and I think one of the scripts that we have is that maybe those people expect that from us. And I think that's been the biggest piece is recognizing that just because I grew up in a an environment that did expect that from me, that not every individual in that environment expected that from me, first of all, that that was kind of more an overarching kind of collective thing, but there were individuals in there that wanted me to be strong and to speak up and to, you know, yeah. have like have a voice and outside of that system that that definitely doesn't always hold true even in a society that does sometimes you know elevate old white men in suits above other people yeah yeah that it's okay to to push back against that and i've i've been surprised so many times when i do stand up and do the uncomfortable thing or you know, disagree with someone politely or, um, you know, add my two cents even after somebody that I consider an authority or, you know, that brings that part of me up that, you know, teenage, young 20 year old part of me up that wants to just kind of kowtow to people in suits, even when someone like that speaks up, um, that, I'm surprised by how often like there's this collaborative spirit and it, it actually goes really well. Yeah. Yeah. Do you find you have an easier time um, doing it in writing? First? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, totally. Totally. I was thinking about that too. You know, it's like, I mean, very literally when we are writing to another individual, we are building scripts in the moment. We have a lot of time to polish and make sure like, am, am I, is this point exactly what I want it to be? There's a little bit of anonymity, right? Mm -hmm. Even if we know the individual that we're engaging with through writing. Um, and so sometimes that's just a really nice place to start mm -hmm. is give yourself the opportunity to, I mean, sit down and write the scripts. Um, when, I, when I came out to my parents as someone who had deconstructed, I sent them like a five page letter. Mm -hmm. um, and that was for me, that was how I needed to share that information. It's in writing. It's I, like, I have it saved. I know exactly where it is. I know exactly what I said. I know exactly the expectations that I created, exactly the boundaries mm -hmm. that exist. Um, and, and that was the best way for me because I could have never said in person yeah. the things that needed to be said, you know, yeah. unless maybe I had a script that I was reading from verbatim. Yeah. Which I love that you bring that up because that is something that you have had me do a couple of times is like, write out. And I think we talked about this in our last podcast where we had a conversation where you write out what you want to say, and it's okay to like sit there and read it to the person because we've talked about on the podcast, how, you know, 97% of our communication is body language and tone of voice. And that sometimes that can get lost in translation with letters. And so that's a, yeah. another option. We can either write a letter and send it or an email and send it, or we can write a letter make sure it says exactly what we want to say. And then we can sit in front of our audience, whoever that is, and read it if it's a really difficult thing. And I, and I think there's something really powerful about that. I mean, we see it done like for very practical reasons and in, in say like interventions. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes if you have to say something very specifically and know that you won't without the aid of a script. I hear people say all the time, oh yeah, but I don't want to, I don't want to use a script because then I won't be able to make eye contact and it'll feel weird. It's like, will it feel as weird as you not saying what you need to say? Mm -hmm. Like what will feel weirder? Because when you make eye contact with that person who is meaningful to you and you, who you have a strong relationship with and you break down in that moment and revert back to old scripts because you didn't have it in front of you, is that going to be more comfortable than reading word for word what needs to be said in order to engage this person? Yeah. Well, I mean, we're talking about being intentional in relationships. I can't think of anything more intentional than saying, look, I care about you so much and I care about our relationship so much. And I care about being able to like 
work through this and improve this so much that I sat down and I wrote this and then I edited it and then I edited it again. And I continued to work with it until I felt like this was the best I could do. This is my best effort at communicating this to you. And I'm sitting in front of you awkwardly and vulnerably reading from a script because this is so difficult, but I'm doing it because I care about you so much that I want to share this with you and work through it if you're willing. Like that kind (laughs) of, that kind of chokes me up a little bit. Like I'm tearing up a little because I think from my perspective now, if my kids or a friend came to me and said, look, I have something that's so difficult to share with you, but it needs to be said. And I'm afraid I won't say it if I don't have this written down on paper. So I'm just going to read from this paper because I care and I want to communicate this like, oh, like I would be in tears like I am now because I would know how much work and effort and love went into that, even though what they're saying is difficult to hear. Right. And it's interesting, right? Because we've, we've talked about this idea of authenticity. Um, and, and, you know, when we've spoken in, in previous podcasts, exactly how I feel about this very vague word authenticity. Um, and we sometimes use it to attack individuals mm-hmm. who are trying to show up intentionally, right? And, and, and be seen, felt, and experienced in another way, you know, like, you know, so I see, you know, so I see you with that letter and I'm like, well, put down that letter and look, you know, look me in the eye, you know, and we try and weaponize authenticity sometimes. And yet what, to your point and what I've understood authenticity to be over the last several years is what's more transparent than saying exactly what needs to be said through letter, like mm-hmm. reading verbatim, what's more vulnerable, what's more honest, you know, what's more autonomous than taking the time to craft a letter that needs to be said to someone. Um, and, and so I really try and push back against that narrative that somehow scripts are disingenuous or they're inauthentic. I think scripts are so powerful. And I think the individuals who come back and say, well, I just need you to be yourself in front of me. They're trying to weaponize whatever they have left so that your point doesn't stick. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I think it's powerful. I think it's really vulnerable, especially in our society that, that does prize so much the eye contact and the, you know, the public speaking presence, whether it's in one-to-one relationships or whether it's on stage to show up. I I feel like that's such a vulnerable thing to show up and say, what I need to say is so difficult and outside of character for me that I'm, I'm willing to read from my phone or from a paper in order to make sure that I get the message across that I intend to get across because I care about you and because I care about our relationship and I care about me too. I want to make sure that my needs are getting met too. Yeah. 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 And sometimes you have to say it all. Oh, I want to just keep playing the rest of this interview for you all, but I feel like this is a really good place for us to stop. Chris has talked so much about the scripts that are running in the subconscious of our mind as we are showing up in the world and building relationships and creating community for ourselves and how sometimes we show up with old scripts and that those are just invitations for us to get curious. I want to recap some of the steps that he brought up throughout the interview. The first one is recognizing when something isn't working. So you might have to set aside intentional time to check in with yourself. What's working? What's not working? I loved his idea of an awareness journal. Journaling has been one of the biggest tools that I've used in order to become aware of some of my subconscious scripts. So use an awareness journal to, you know, ask yourself a question. I'll often put at the top of my journaling page the question that I want answered. Why did I show up that way with this person? And then I allow myself to just kind of stream of consciousness, journal, whatever comes to mind and allow my brain to sort of explore it as I'm writing those things down with my pen. And when I feel complete, then I'll go back and I'll read what I wrote. And that allows me to get really clear about what it is that's going on underneath the surface. And that's where I can identify some of these subconscious scripts that I might be running my life and my relationships by. And I can ask myself things like, 
you know, if I had to condense this down, what is the script running in the background? Where did this script come from? Who did I learn it from? What benefits did it give me? And why does it pop up now? Like, are there certain situations that will make this more likely to come to the surface? So that allows us to get really conscious about the subconscious scripts we have. And then from there, like Chris said, we can write a new script. And so in that same journal, you can write what you would like to do instead and how you would like to show up, how you would like to be experienced, and you can begin to practice those things. Now, remember, we're writing a first draft of the script. Some of the things will work and some might not work. You'll try things on and figure that out as you go and continue to practice these steps again and again until you arrive at a place, at least in this circumstance, where you feel really comfortable. So again, it might feel really clunky at first, but as you continue to practice, it'll feel more and more comfortable and you'll fit into that role. But as you practice, you'll feel more and more comfortable and you'll be able to kind of fit into that new pattern of behavior like a second skin. Now, if you want more from Chris, like I'm sure many of you do between now and next week, please go to his website, www.speakintoaction.com. Dot com. There's two comms there. The first com stands for communication. So speak into action com.com, or you can find him on Instagram. He's always sharing lots of great insights and cute little clips of his family. And you can find him at Chris Speaks Up. I look forward to hearing from you all in my messages, in my email. And if you are part of the live call this Wednesday at 6 30 p.m., we will be discussing some of these topics. And until then, I can't wait to share the rest of this interview with you next Sunday.